Hi, everyone. Welcome or welcome back to my channel. So today we are really excited to welcome Dr. Crystal Porter to the channel. So first, we want to give a huge shout out to Alicia Light, who introduced me to Dr. Crystal. And um, so shout out to Alicia. Thank you so much for the recommendation and the referral. Um, and then we also want to say um, a huge thank you to Dr. Crystal for making the time to share her expertise. Like it is, we know time is a commodity right now. And so for her to take the time to share her expertise is a gift. And so thank you, Dr. Porter um, for that. And so um, Dr. Crystal Porter is a hair scientist whose expertise is leveraged as the owner of Main Insights, um, which is a company that specializes in re researches hair and scalp needs of people of African heritage. She's also the founder of the Association of Professional Tricholo Trichologists, which is a nonprofit association organization dedicated to advancing the trichology industry by serving uh, key stakeholders within the areas of hair and scalp health. Now, she is brilliant. She is entrepreneurial. And welcome, Dr. Crystal. And now we're going to ask you to tell us a little bit more about yourself. So today, actually, we're going to talk about the science of hair health. We're going to talk about trichology. And so many of you were so gracious enough to ask a lot of questions. And so we're going to get to those as well. So grab your beverage of choice, buckle up, and let's get going. Awesome. So, Dr. Crystal, tell us, who is Dr. Crystal Porter? So first of all, thank you for welcoming me to the platform. I love what you are doing and am honored to be here and to share. Um, but who am I? Um, you know, so I am an ordinary person, I feel. Um, and so I am, of course, a mom, I'm a wife. Um, as you said, I'm a hair scientist. And um, I jump double dutch. I mean, I, I really am just an ordinary person who likes to um, stay in shape and um, I'm active and a lot of public service. Um, I, I'm a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated as well. So, I mean, okay. I, I wear a lot of different hats. Awesome. Awesome. So, um, and one of my best friends is a double dutch. She does double, double, double dutch too. So, I'll, so um, for um, in terms of when we first I learned about you, I went on the website and 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 saw the information and the resources that you have. Really good videos on her YouTube channel. So go check those out too. Um, after you watch this, and then um, she, Dr. Crystal, tell us about the Our Black Hair Matters movement. Um, and maybe before we get to that, actually, I'm fascinated because you shared with me a little bit about you are, um, um, you becoming a biochemist or a bio a scientist. So can you talk to us a little bit about that? I'd love to hear about how people kind of find their way into their roles. Um, and maybe some of your background, you worked at L'Oreal. So could you yeah. tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So, uh, I did not plan to be a hair scientist or in the cosmetic science realm at all. Uh, so my training um, as an undergraduate was um, in chemistry. So I was a biochemistry major and um, I wanted to do research that was more material science. And so I went to an engineering school, um, what was at the time, the um, University of Missouri in Rolla, it was um, the engineering campus. Um, now it's called the Missouri University of Science and Technology. But I went there because I wanted to focus my graduate studies on understanding polymer composites and understanding how the molecular makeup of materials impact the quality of the materials. So mm -hmm. you can have materials that are soft, you can have materials that are hard and brittle. Um, how do you play with the chemistry to make mm -hmm. the characteristics of the material the ideal? And so I um, love working with my hands and breaking things. So I, I did a lot of stuff um, looking at the mechanical properties of polymer composites. Um, and so I went to a conference and someone from Unilever, um, a hair care brand, well, actually a um, consumer uh, products company, they had a, uh, a department where they studied hair chemistry or hair science. And so 
they requested an interview from me and I had never heard of the company Unilever. I never even thought about the fact that hair is a biomaterial and so it's very relevant to what I studied, but I mm. couldn't really understand the significance at that time. Um, but that was my first hire. So from grad school, I worked at Unilever. And in 2002, L'Oreal created the Institute for Ethnic Hair and Skin Research. And um, I was still working at Unilever and they held like conferences. And so I attended their very first conference and was just amazed. Um, I mean, who wouldn't want to be a part of understanding the science about your hair, right. you know, it, it just seems just like, wow, what a dream. And so I took the plunge and um, put my hat in the ring, so to speak, and was hired as one of the first scientists there. And so um, for over 10 years, we were there studying um, hair and skin um, for people um, of African descent, mostly. Um, but it was a opportunity of a lifetime. And that is really where I, I got my hold in <laughs> in awesome. the industry. Yeah, it was awesome. Awesome. So, so now let's talk a little bit about the Black Hair Matters movement. Um, what, how did that even begin? And, and what's your vision, I guess, for it? Yeah, so uh, as a scientist, and I think my fellow peers would agree, when you look on social media, and, and I think it's, it's worse now than it was even five years ago, but there was just a lot of people, a lot of talking heads, mm -hmm. talking about their experiences, giving advice based on their particular uh, just experiences that they had that were unique to them. Mm -hmm. And people were gravitating and asking all these questions to me about, hey, did you see this? Mm -hmm. I heard that they talked about using um, baking soda on the scalp. Is, is that healthy? Or, you know, and so I was like, where's all this stuff coming from? And then, of course, with me being a scientist, I yearned to see, okay, where is this information originating from? Is this just an idea someone has? Or is there real meaning behind it because someone studied it? And so um, I was yearning for that. It wasn't there. And so that is why I was like, you know, I think there needs to be a platform Mm -hmm. um, for us to talk about our Black Hair Matters right. and to yell and get on my soapbox up and, and state that our Black hair does matter because we as Black people, um, we spend four times the amount that um, our counterparts, I'll say like Caucasian spend on hair care. We have more problems than any other ethnic group. And we are the most dissatisfied. And so we need to have a way to tell the powers mm -hmm. that be, um, whether it's a large corporation or even those small mom and pop organizations or establishments right. that are trying to create uh, products for our needs. And so if we don't say what our needs are, then how are we going to expect them to understand the totality of what we need? Because as you know, um, the curl degree ranges from, you know, loosely curled to tightly coiled. And the needs are going to differ not only based on the curl degree, but also based on what we ultimately want to achieve. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there's a whole, you know, spectrum of mm -hmm. considerations and we need to talk about it. And that's what the platform is for. Awesome. Awesome. So again, remember, go over and check her platform out. There's some good, good content there as well. Um, so when thinking about the science of black hair, right? And so I heard one dermatologist say essentially, and maybe we can do the science of black hair and just hair in general, particularly related to hair loss, because we do have women from all backgrounds here. A lot of them are black women from the, the diaspora, from, you know, from a lot of places. And we also have people from other um, ethnicities as well. But thinking about the science of hair and the science of black hair, 
And um, I heard a dermatologist say that there's essentially an ec epidemic of hair loss that they're seeing, particularly among women of color, black women. Are you, does that resonate with you? Are you seeing that as well as a scientist from, from the science background? Um, and maybe even talk about the state of hair loss um, and what they're seeing and what we're, what, what, what maybe is coming from the science background, science perspective. Yeah, so um, it is interesting you're, you're bringing this up at this time because I just came back from the World Congress of, um, of hair research. Mm -hmm. um, and I was amazed that not only the, um, I, it was 40 com countries represented, which was like awesome. So, I mean, it really was a world Congress. And there was a few sections um, or there were a few sections on textured hair. Mm -hmm. And so that speaks to the specific needs that we have, particularly as Black women um, in particular. So talking about um, hair loss. So originally, and I made mention of this, my background is more in material science. And so when I first started my company, Main Insights, it really was B2C, so business to consumer, because I felt that if I educated the consumer, I could actually study their hair, let them know what was going on, get background information about their lifestyle, all the little things that's going to impact hair quality issues. Mm -hmm. And more and more, as I spoke to people, I was like, okay, it's something going on here. Mm -hmm. And in order for me to help you from a material science standpoint, you have to have hair. Yeah. But more and more, I was learning that people were having a problem having hair on their head. And I was like, oh, wow, th this is not what I expected. And mm -hmm. so I, it, it was just a, a natural progression mm -hmm. to start inquiring about that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And so I have a research partner, Dr. Jared Hampton Marcel, and he is an expert on the microbiome. And so he and I started partnering to try to understand um, the, the health of the scalp from yeah. a microbiome standpoint. And so that was kind of my entry point to scalp health. And so while that isn't um, the area of research that I thought I was going to be going into as an entrepreneur, it just kind of fell in my lap and ended up being that way. And so if we talk about some of the issues in particular, I mean, and I can talk forever about this, so I'll try to keep it brief. Uh-uh, no, I want to hear, like, I want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> if we talk about scalp issues, particularly that women of African heritage are, are um, having issues with. Um, the main one is traction alopecia, I would say. Mm -hmm. And a very close second is central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia, which is, you know, that's a mouthful. So yep. CCCA. Mm -hmm. um, and so in talking about traction alopecia, that's an alopecia that can be prevented. Mm -hmm. And so just because of our culture, we have, um, well, our culture and because of the morphology of our hair or the shape of our hair, mm -hmm. sometimes we implement grooming habits that um, allow us to control our hair in a way that makes it just easier to live. Right. And so we wear braids. And um, a lot of times if you do corn rolls, if they're installed too tight or if they're put in too tight, then you pull because traction means pull. You mm -hmm. can actually pull the hair follicle, I mean, the hair fiber from the follicle. Mm -hmm. That's totally preventative. You, you, you don't have to pull so tight, mm -hmm. um, but there are certain conditions that can even make you more susceptible to having traction alopecia and so um, if you suffer from dandruff or seborrheic dermatitis where mm -hmm. your hair or your scalp flakes, then sometimes, and we don't really understand exactly what it is that's going on, mm -hmm. but it makes the hair 
the force that it takes to have the fiber removed from the follicle, it is just a lower force. And so it comes mm -hmm. out more readily. And so um, we as scientists need to understand that more, but mm -hmm. those who suffer from seborrheic dermatitis or um, really bad dandruff mm -hmm. have a, a tendency to be more susceptible to it. So you really have to be careful. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and that includes me. I, um, when I wore my hair or grew my hair out natural, the first time that I did it, the way that I did it was to wear cornrows, mm -hmm. but I do suffer from seborrheic dermatitis. So I started noticing that my hair was coming out along the perimeter of my hairline. But the great thing about it is if you catch it early or you notice it early, it's reversible. Right, right. So it's very important for you to be aware when you wear those types of styles and where you're pulling that you look and make sure. And sometimes it's not as easy to, to see it. Right, but right. the way that I was able to see it is because I'm very sensitive about my seborrheic dermatitis. So when I start seeing, you know, any white, I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> you know, am I starting to, to flake right. it, you know? And so I look and I would see the bulb of the hair fiber that mm -hmm. was just it come out and so while my hair was in the cornrows I could see the bulb what and is I, that I'm sorry what is the bulb like what is the bulb because I used before I had this before I had my major loss I would see that the I would the bulb would come out with the hair yeah you know, what what is what is that yeah so when your hair is in your scalp, you know, in the follicle, mm -hmm. it receives nutrients and, you know, it, it actually helps to anchor mm -hmm. the hair fiber in your scalp. And so you have different um, phases of, of hair growth. The hair bulb is an extension of the hair fiber that is growing out of your scalp. Mm -hmm. And so when your fiber, when, when your hair um, grows, you know, it gets nutrients mm -hmm. from the hair follicle. And so the bulb is kind of the, the area in which that happens. And mm -hmm. so there is a natural uh, way that the hair grows. And so you have phases. And mm -hmm. so the antigen phase is the hair growth phase. Mm -hmm. And so while it's growing, um, your that bulb is the vehicle in which you receive the nutrients for hair growth. Mm -hmm. But then you have the telogen phase when the hair naturally, supposedly naturally comes out, um, the hair is shedded from mm -hmm. the scalp and that is the telogen phase. And so that bulb is attached. Okay. It's just a part of the biology of the hair fiber itself. Okay. So with the telogen phase, because some of us are more prone to telogen, I think it's, it's blue, effluvium when it just sheds after a major stress mm -hmm. event or things like that. Yeah. And so the bulb may or may not be on the hair shaft at that point. It It, it is attached. Mm -hmm. it, if it comes out of the scalp mm -hmm. or from the follicle, you usually do have that bulb, okay. but the, the morphology of the bulb changes. Okay. And so for example, if I were to pluck my hair, mm -hmm. the way that the bulb looks, Mm -hmm. It's totally different than if it naturally comes out. Interesting. Because it goes through those phases. And so, you know, if you pluck it, you are disrupting the blood flow and, you know, how it gets its nutrients and it just appears differently. Okay. Yeah. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. Okay. So we yeah. can go back to what you were saying before I cut you off. <laughs> you were talking about. Okay. So I was talking about the, um, oh, the different types of alopecia. I was talking about traction alopecia. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so um, the good news is that it is reversible. And so if you stop the pulling, then you will more than likely keep your hair. Now, there are some other problems that could exist that can make your hair continue to to come out. But mm -hmm. for the most part, if it's truly traction alopecia and that's all you're suffering from, your hair will start to regrow. Mm -hmm. But if you traumatize the follicle so much that you're continuously pulling on it, it is going mm -hmm. to unfortunately stop growing hair. Okay. And that's when you have the traction alopecia and your um, scalp becomes scarred over. 
because of the because of the constant trauma mm -hmm. yeah so mm -hmm. stop traumatizing those uh <laughs> those followers yeah. and so we need to from. know that we yeah, need to absolutely. That. So and, now, oh, go ahead. Can we talk about the um, CC, the other? <laughs> CCCA, yes. Mm -hmm. So um, over the past few years, there has been research to show that there is a genetic component to having CCCA. And it's interesting because when I was um, working at L'Oreal and I was going to different conferences, there were all types of hypotheses in terms of, oh, if you combine... Um, wearing a hair prosthesis or a weave mm -hmm. and your hair is relaxed and you have a higher propensity of getting CCC. I mean, it was all these things. Mm -hmm. And um, there is a genetic component, but I'm not convinced that that is the only reason why you would get it. And so we need to, as scientists, we need to understand that more. Yeah. I'm, I, um, as a person with it, <laughs> not I'm not a scientist, but I'm a person with with. They she said it was early scarring, so we got it. She said we we kind of we got it in time, but um, the as a as a someone with it, what the part that I think or the things that have that I've done that made the most impact that I I think it, it's really connected to the microbiome. That's why I'm interested to hear when we say microbiome and gut health. Um, because can we talk a little bit about that? Like, what are your, what are the things that you've seen around, you know, between the microbiome and scalp health? Are there yeah. any connections you can share? So let me be a little bit more specific when I talk about the microbiome. So what we're used to hearing about is gut health. Right. right. You know, everybody's taking Activia and <laughs> their probiotics. And so mm -hmm. that is um, a part of, gu of gu the gut health. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. However, your microbiome is everywhere. So it's not just in your gut. It's also in the space that I'm in right now. Mm -hmm. um, if you were to come into my office, then your microbiome, your personal microbiome will blend with my environment. And so mm -hmm. there are um, spaces of uniqueness when it comes to the microbes that exist. And so there is a state where everything is working in harmony mm -hmm. and everything is good. So I'm getting away from the gut. I'm just talking about in yeah. general, mm -hmm. even though it applies to, you know, different systems as well. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in your gut, um, even in your hair follicle, Right. The microbiome differs and there's more new research about that, but okay. also even on the surface of your scalp. So okay. when I say microbiome, I'm actually talking about the surface. I'm, I'm talking about okay. um, the environment that your hair or your scalp is, is in. Okay. Okay. And as you know, we use all types of products. And of course, the implications of all the various products that we use that, that we use that is going to impact our microbiome right. and we need to understand how the different ways that we um, manipulate our hair because when you pull on the hair when it is being braided how is that disrupting what's going on you know are there mm. inflammatory biomarkers that are there that exacerbate the flora of the scalp I mean it's so many different variables that we need to consider. Mm -hmm. And we really don't understand it. Right. We really don't understand it. So when I started um, doing this research with mm -hmm. Dr. J Jared Hampton Marcel, um, he, he and I were very aware of the complexities mm -hmm. of what we were getting into. And I wasn't convinced at the time that we initially started that we would be able to see anything. Right. And we were really surprised that even on one head, so if you swab the scalp, the scalp of an area where you do have alopecia, or mm -hmm. I'll say hair loss, because the people that we studied, they weren't diagnosed officially, so we have to call right. it hair loss. Okay. So where you have hair loss, the microbiome is definitely different compared to other areas of the scalp where you have hair. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the environment doesn't change that mu much on one or on one particular subject. Mm -hmm. And so I was amazed 
that the technique we were using was sensitive enough to be able to see those differences. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so what's exciting about science now is technology is always improving and it increases the sensitivity of what we can see and okay. the differences that we can measure. And okay. so I'm happy to know that um, the technology is there where we can observe that there are differences, mm -hmm. but now we need to know what those differences really mean. And so we're in the process of really learning about that. Okay, that was my next question. So we'll have to wait to get that information. <laughs> we'll have to wait to get that information. Yeah, so, it, it's always yeah. Um, exciting to see that something is happening, the what, Right. Then we have to explore the why and the how. Right. Right. That makes perfect sense, which is why you're the scientist. So, um, so one of the questions that um, this is more, this might be my personal question, but others have the question as well. When we talk about um, dry hair, like the when the shit when the hair is dry. Many of us dealing particularly with CCCA and different types of alopecia, we it's almost like the dryness is like amplified, right? So from a scientific scientific perspective, can you talk to us about dry hair and are there ways to um, mitigate or support, you know? Yeah. So from the scientific perspective, it can be a little complicated. Okay. Because when we talk about dry hair as consumers, we are talking about how the hair looks and how it feels. So it mm -hmm. can look dry and it can feel dry. So are you talking about feeling dry? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, we're, feeling dry, but then also sometimes even if it, we're, we're always trying, many of us, we're trying to avoid it breaking off because it's dry, it's not moisturized, or it's not, you know, it doesn't have the nutrients that it needs. And is just thinking through, it feels like it's more extreme for many of us who have CCCA struggling with dry hair. So mm -hmm. maybe it's the look and the feel, whatever you want to, whatever you feel we, we should know about <laughs> Right. Okay. So from a scientific standpoint, dry hair has to deal with the amount of water content in the hair. Mm -hmm. And it's complicated because believe it or not, if your hair is drier or it, it meaning it doesn't have the moisture content that it should have, mm -hmm. that actually is an indication of damage. Mm -hmm. And so damaged hair has less water content. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and so it's different scientifically how we talk about it and then what the consumer, consumer. Mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but one thing about curlier hair is we feel our hair is more pliable and more supple when it has water. Mm -hmm. So when it is moisturized or hydrated, mm -hmm. we like that feel. And it, it, it's because our hair responds better. You know, it moves, it, um, it, it feels better. Mm -hmm. that, that pliability is something that we desire. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about um, dry hair, we really should be thinking about the moisture content. Mm -hmm. And I have heard that many women who suffer from CCCA feel that their hair just isn't doing what it should do. And so it's, it's interesting to hear that you say that it feels drier. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and moisture content is, is a little tricky because our hair will equilibrate to its environment. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you're in Arizona, where it's dry and you cleanse your hair and then you go out into the elements, even if it's not a, a hot day, it, it's just dry. It's not a lot of moisture in the air. Your hair or the rate in which your hair loses water is going to be greater. So it's going to lose water faster. And so we use products to try to combat that. Right, right. And so believe it or not, when you have different products that coat the hair, Right. So a lot of people say, oh, oil and oil isn't always the good, a, a, a good product to hold in moisture. OK, that's and, where we, that's, that's what we need to know, the science. <laughs> well, so it, it really depends on the oil. 
Okay. So some oils penetrate and some actually stay on the surface. So uh -huh. for example, mineral oil, mm -hmm. a lot of people say stay away from it, but it's going to coat the hair. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's not going to penetrate. Not to say that it doesn't necessarily effectively because you have to have it bind to the hair as well so that mm -hmm. it, it sticks and, and holds in the moisture. Um, but a lot of oils that we like are those that penetrate. So like the almond oils, the mm -hmm. coconut oils, they actually penetrate inside the hair. And so you're not necessarily going to hold in or lock in moisture okay. by using some of those oils. Okay. But some of the products um, that have like polymers in it. Um, uh, so I know people are poo-pooing on petro petroleum jelly as well. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that is something that's occlusive, meaning that it's going to coat the hair. And so things like that will hold in moisture. But the problem is <laughs> no one wants the feel of Vaseline or mineral oil on the hair. And so it's kind of a catch-22. Right. And then people don't like silicones. Now, they're not good for the environment, but they're excellent for the hair. The hair in terms of the slippage and sometimes, you know, if you use the type of silicone that does coat the hair, then it helps with retaining mm -hmm. moisture as well. So it really depends on um, the outcome that we want in terms of what we should use. And also the style will dictate that as well, because right. if you right. wear your hair straight, you don't want the heaviness. You want, you know, your hair to move. You want it to be, have body. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those occlusive or those, um, the products that seal, you don't mm -hmm. like it because it could be a little bit heavier. So, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's kind of a, of a caveat and all of, in our hair doesn't respond the same depending upon its history. Right. Right. So when everything we, is so unique, like it's so unique to that individual's it lifestyle is. experience. Okay. And the environment, you know, right. right. I, for years, I've been talking about how I love to leave Chicago and cleanse my hair like in, in LA because the water is softer and my hair feels better after I cleanse it. And I'm like, oh, I like this. You know, I don't have to use as much product, but all of that will impact how your hair responds to products. So it's a whole list of variables yeah, that need yeah. to be considered. Yeah, that's good. That's good. So can we talk, there's two questions we wanted to talk to, and we'll close out the, the, the section on the science of Black hair. One is around how does our lifestyle and genetics, um, mm -hmm. how do our lifestyle, genetics, environment um, impact the health of our hair? And then, the, and then maybe we can segue into sort of caring for our hair as we age. A lot of the women on this channel are 30 plus, 40 plus, 50 plus, 60 plus. Um, and you know, are there any, or is, is there anything, is there anything different we should be doing from a site, from a scientific perspective? Yeah. So I already talked a, a little bit uh, about the environment, mm -hmm. but, um, I, I would say lifestyle is huge in terms of the science of the hair. And so I was talking about that hair history, right? Mm -hmm. And so the products that you use for cleansing will dictate, um, how your hair responds, um, the conditioners that you use, the styling products that you use, any hair um, implements that you use. So if you use blow dryers or flat irons or um, any other type of implement, I mean, it, it's all kind of devices that they have up out now. I can't even keep up. Mm -hmm. But even how you style it in terms of braiding, um, I had when I was helping consumers directly and I would get information particularly about what was going on with them. There was one situation where this young girl, I think she was eight years old at the time, her mom said her hair kept breaking off. And so she told me that she would wear her hair in braids. And so I probed a little bit about the types of products that were used while the hair was being braided, the condition. And she said, oh, she braids her hair while wet. And then I was like, ding, 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 ding. Yes, that's why she's experiencing the breakage because while it's easier to manipulate our hair when it's more pliable, mm -hmm. that is the most fragile state of our hair mm -hmm. is when it's wet. Mm -hmm. so it's always a caveat. <laughs> right. So while our hair is weaker, 
in this wet state, it feels better and it's easier to manipulate. So we have to be extremely careful. So I make that point because when you're braiding the hair, and we mentioned this earlier, when you're pulling on those fibers mm -hmm. and it's in this weakest state, then the hair is actually going to be more readily deformed. And we, when you deform it and then hold it in that mm -hmm. state, then it's weaker. Okay. Okay. So there's so many different things that we have to consider just because of some of the cultural uh, things that we do in terms of styling, the products that we use. So mm -hmm. all of that is going to dictate the quality. Mm -hmm. And I always say, even if you want to do your hair yourself, if you can at least have a consultation with a stylist who knows this, who is knowledgeable about all these caveats, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's um, useful <laughs> to learn about your hair and then start doing something with your hair that is based on the outcome that you want, the products that are best for it. And at the end of the day, everyone wants to look and feel beautiful. And so you really need to sometimes have guidance in how to best do that. Right, right. From right. someone you trust. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Okay, so now let's transition a little bit and let's talk about trichology, right? So you are the founder of the Association of Professional Trichologists, um, and we would love to hear about that organization. Um, it's it's the way I think you described it is designed for the professional, right? And so can you talk to us a little bit about the field and maybe the association and maybe your hopes for it? Yeah, so let's talk about trichology. Um, trichology is the study of hair and scalp diseases. So when you see a trichologist, they have more education on diseases of the hair and scalp compared to like your normal tri um, your normal cosmetologist. Mm -hmm. um, not to say that cosmetologists don't know about the field. I think they are introduced to it, but not in depth. And so there are different ranges of education that you can get in trichology. Some are three hour introductory courses mm -hmm. and some range to like a, a program that will last up to two years. So it really depends on where you're getting your education from and the amount of um, knowledge that you are seeking. And there are different programs. So having said that, I have found that because people at the end of the day want to look and feel beautiful, when I was helping people on an individualized basis and letting them know what their hair needed and options for them, I soon found out that we are creature, creatures of habit. And if I say you don't need to oil your scalp and then you continue to do so, you, you just feel better doing it. And so I wanted... A pro I wanted to pair with professionals who can help those who had problems with their hair and scalp. And um, it was very tough to just, if, if you just have a basic cosmetology degree and you aren't aware of some of the other issues, Mm -hmm. then it was difficult for me to partner with a cosmetologist who did not appreciate that there were other problems that people would have other than having their hair styled. And also making sure that the cosmetologist implemented styles that were in line with the need, the, to the total need of mm -hmm. their clientele. Mm -hmm. And so I found that trichologists, they were the population who I felt were conscientious mm -hmm. enough to know that I have to use discernment in terms of, I know this client came said, saying they wanted, um, you know, a, a weed, mm -hmm. but they are suffering from traction alopecia right. and that really isn't best for them. So what else can I offer this particular client? And so when you're conscientious enough, then these are the people that I want to work with. So I kind of gravitated more towards the trichologist to really try to help those who needed uh, assistance in knowing how to steer the, to um, how to style their hair when they were having issues with the scalp. Mm -hmm. 
And so I started listening to them. And because there are different levels of education, mm -hmm. they kept saying, we need to make sure that others who are saying that they're trichologists, they aren't certified or they don't have the credentials to properly help people. And so there needs to be a point of differentiation between what I have in terms of my knowledge and um, how I treat people and others who just put on a white coat and put trichologists, you know, next to their name and, and that's it. And I come from an industry that has an association. Mm -hmm. I know this association from high school <laughs> and they have been with me through all educational time points into being an industry. And so mm -hmm. this association is a support system for those who are in my area of chemistry. Mm -hmm. And so uh, an association like this does not or did not exist. And, and I want to make it clear that we don't teach trichology. There are, are enough entities out there that will lay the foundation for trichology knowledge. So okay. that's not our role. Our role is to help those who are key stakeholders in the industry. So okay. even if you are a cosmetologist and you are trying to figure out, okay, how do I learn more about trichology? You can actually be surrounded by people who are in the industry and you can make an informed decision about how to navigate within the space. Okay. Mm -hmm. But it's not just for trichologists. It's also for those key stakeholders who care about trichology, meaning the science of the hair and scalp. Mm -hmm. And so I invite those who are in industry to join, those who are in nutrition to join, mm -hmm. those who um, are in research, such as myself. Mm -hmm. You know, so it really is for all of us to have a home and for us to collaborate mm -hmm. because that is what is really needed. <laughs> Right. And right. Um, there are trichologists who are out there doing unethical things. Um, they are calling themselves doctors when they are not. Right. They're saying that they have PhDs from schools that don't exist. So, um, yeah, it's it's a mess. <laughs> and I think the only answer to this is credentialing. OK. And credentialing would be through a third party. Mm hmm where a lot of subject matter experts will come together from all over the world to say, okay, these are the things that are important. And these are the competencies that someone who has the title of trichologist should have. Mm -hmm. It may be different levels. I mean, we are still trying to get all that together, <laughs> mm -hmm. but it's extremely important because the public needs to trust a professional who is going to not only give them knowledge, but also make them look and feel beautiful. Right. And there needs to be a bridge between the cosmetologist or the hairstylist and the dermatologist. So I haven't mentioned the importance of dermatology yet, but it's extremely important because they are medical physicians Mm -hmm. And not all dermatologists have an expertise in hair loss, right? but they have definitely been trained. Mm -hmm. But if you have a hair loss issue, it is best to go to a dermatologist who specializes in hair loss mm -hmm. and who are board certified as well. Mm -hmm. And I always say, look for a trichologist who collaborates with a dermatologist, a board certified dermatologist who is an expert in hair loss, right. because that is the best of both worlds. In my That's exact, that was my next question, right? It said that we should, if we're looking for a trichologist, um, they should be connected to a board certified dermatologist, right? Absolutely. And it's unfortunate because not all trichologists are created equal. But like I said, all dermatologists aren't created equal either exactly. because not all of them have that expertise in hair loss, which for some problems that are that, that exist, that is mm -hmm. needed. There are nuances that must be considered, especially when it comes to hair care practices. Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. for those of us who have curly or coily hair, um, giving a prescription for ketoconazole, ketoconazole shampoo, which is very drying, and just saying use this, you right. know, twice a week. Most people will stop using it because of the effects, the negative effects that it'll have on the hair. So everything needs to be put into context. Mm -hmm. And if you should only apply it to the scalp and then work it through and then rinse it out and then follow it, follow up with a conditioning shampoo. These are the things that should be said, but mm -hmm. if you don't understand the, the culture or the population you're dealing with, um, also having someone who cleanses their, who normally cleans, cleanses their hair once ideally a week, mm -hmm. <laughs> twice a week at the most, but sometimes every three months, every four months, if they have extensions and they keep them in, you know, so it's a wide range of different um, ways that we style the hair or maintain our hair. And so all these things need to be considered and these questions need, need to be asked before someone can really get an ideal way of dealing with their hair loss issue. Absolutely. So now let's transition to our questions and we'll try to We'll go through as, just tell me where you want to go <laughs> with the, with the questions or the, you know, um, in, in, in terms of the response. And so um, I do want to give everyone a shout out for asking your questions. Thank you so much. Um, and if I, I tried to remove the ones that were redundant. So catch me if I, <laughs> if I repeat a similar question, but um, so let's get started this first question. So you, have, you talked about this a little bit earlier. So the, the question is, they've seen a lot of dermatologists and trichologists and cosmetologists say that oiling the scalp feeds bacteria that live on the scalp that lead to scalp issues and can also block hair follicles resulting in alopecia. So the question, there's a broader question around, should we oil? Should we not oil our scalp? I've seen, personally, I've seen chemists say yes. I've seen chemists say no. I think, you know, so is there any... Um, from your perspective, um, oiling the scalp. You kind of talked about a little bit about the hair, but what about the scalp? Yeah. So I don't oil my scalp. However, there are people who have beautiful hair with no issues who do. Right. And because we are all individuals, that goes to the personalization aspect. Mm -hmm. of how we need to answer this question. So usually I say, no, you don't need to oil your, oil your scalp. But if you live in Arizona, I talked about this earlier, mm -hmm. and your skin is dry and your scalp is dry and you feel that that soothes your skin and you don't have any adverse effects, mm -hmm. I don't see a problem with you doing it. Now, I wouldn't say, oh yeah, everybody <laughs> needs to do it. Mm -hmm. But I would say you usually don't have to do it unless you are in an environment which requires you to do it just to be comfortable. Now, I said earlier that I suffer from seborrheic dermatitis. Mm -hmm. I don't need those oils because the yeast that feeds, <laughs> that exacerbates the problem, mm -hmm. the malassezia yeast, loves to eat on that. And so I make my problem worse when okay. I do that. But that's specific to me. Right. And so it depends, but for the most part, most people do not have to oil their scalp. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. So the next question is around um the use of minoxidil or Rogaine mm -hmm. um from just from a scientific scientific perspective actually minoxidil is rogaine the, it's the brand layman's, name from layman's term for okay yeah. okay yeah, so the brand okay yeah Please. so um the science says that for non-scarring alopecia i shouldn't say not all well for most non-scarring alopecias that it seems to be effective in helping the hair to grow however not everything is 100 percent 
And usually you get better results when it's combined with another type of treatment as well. So mm. it depends. Mm -hmm. And um, I, to be honest, when you implement mm. that as a strategy, I would definitely go and see a dermatologist and be guided mm -hmm. with someone who really knows about right. hair loss issues. Mm -hmm. um, I, oh, go ahead. I would say I, I talked about that with my dermatologist and, and she mentioned that if you take it, you more than likely will need to continue to take it sort of, you mm -hmm. know, and, and we kind of made the decision. We won't, let's not do it right now. Not that I would never do it, but let's just not, let's hold off right now and let's try these other, you know, options. Um, so that was one of the reasons why I personally chose not to use it at the time, but it is data that shows that it is effective and it is FDA approved. Yes. So the FDA does approve minoxidil as a treatment for non-scarring hair loss. Mm -hmm. So, and that's important though, you said non-scarring. So that's the other part. People need to make sure they work with their dermatologists. Well, so- not, not buy it over the counter with, you know, self-treating. Well, you, you can, so sometimes there's a long delay and getting to see a dermatologist true. and be able to <laughs> buy minoxidil over the counter, you why not? Mm. You really have nothing to lose, especially if you can start to reverse the hair loss. The hair loss. So it's nothing wrong with starting off on, on your own. Mm -hmm. I mean, they do offer it over the counter, so why not? Um, but I, I would say to optimize the results while mm. you're waiting. <laughs> to see a dermatologist, mm -hmm. you can do it, um, but you're right. You you do have to continue to do it, um, and I I don't have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. If there is something that's going on with my body, right. and exactly. I need to continue to do whatever it is that's going to help my body to mm -hmm. be optimized and work the way it should, I don't see a problem doing yeah. that. Yeah. Well, yeah. some of us do it. We're doing it with something, so maybe it's a supplement. So you're still whatever it is you're taking. Like for, I'm I take turmeric. I've been taking it since. I'm going to keep taking it. So if I were to, I'm I'm okay with that as well. Like I'm okay with if I need to take it to help the healing process, whatever it is, whether it's medication or a supplement, I personally don't have a problem <laughs> with. Now I also want to talk about scarring because I did specify that it helps with non-scarring, but with scarring alopecia and there are several types that's beyond the scope of what we're talking about. But if you do suffer from scarring alopecia, a lot of times the follicle that is scarred over is sitting next to a follicle that is not scarred. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to make sure that that follicle, the follicle that is vibrant and, and still working, mm -hmm. you want to allow it to continue to function. And so using something like minoxidil can help prevent the scar, the non-scarred follicles from scarring over. That's the first time I've heard that. And so yeah. you, you want to make sure that even though it may not help with the follicles that no mm -hmm. longer produce hair, it mm -hmm. will help to camouflage. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, keep those follicles viable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's good. Good information. Um, and you talked about washing your hair. You essentially you said someone asked, "How should we be washing our hair?" Um, mm -hmm. And does it vary depending on the texture? Someone asked. Oh. Me. Mm -hmm. So there is research that has come out that ideally it is best to cleanse your hair once a week if you can. Mm -hmm. Once a week is ideal. If you have to stretch it out to two weeks, okay, but you know, um, ideally once a week and usually, so I, I don't fix what's not broken. Mm -hmm. There have been years that we have cleansed our hair every other week and have not had any problems, but if you're starting to have problems, increasing the frequency will help. Mm -hmm. Um, but it just helps to reset so that you can get that balance. So we talked about the microbiome. You want the environment of the microbes and you know people are always saying oh it fights bacteria it fights all this and I tell people all the time you're disrupting the normal flora of the environment mm -hmm. so seeing that you're using something that's antibacterial isn't necessarily the 
the solution to the problem. You want a healthy balance, mm-hmm. and we're still learning what that healthy balance is. Mm-hmm. But um, it's not always about um, it, it, it's a reset to make right. sure that there isn't what we call dysbiosis, meaning right. that you have an offset of the balance. And so then it's going to negatively impact the health of your scalp. You yeah. want that balance. Absolutely. I find I can't, I can't go more than seven days without having, it starts itching or it start, like, I know I have to wash within five to seven days or it's just not pretty. <laughs> and that's you listening to your body. And that's really what's important to be honest with you. <laughs> we as women in particular, um, we have a habit of, of suffering Mm -hmm. for the sake of beauty Mm -hmm. and we need to start listening to our bodies more (laughs) and do what's right so I I take it the itching goes away when you cleanse it right 100% okay (laughs) 100% (laughs) that is what's right for your body and some people can go every other week and be fine right Right. And if that works for them, that's fine. But as soon as you start experiencing problems, right. Right. it's time to change things up, especially as we get older. Our bodies do not work as efficiently as they used to. <sighs> <laughs> now that is the truth. Yes. And so sometimes we have to nurse our bodies, you know, to be as optimal in that snap in time or that uh, snapshot right. in time that, that we can. Right. And it also speaks to, I know we've done a lot of science, a lot of psychology and a lot of even the things on their channel. It also, we also just talk about life. Like it also is just about, you said it best, like listen to your body. Like we need to slow down. We need to, you know, take a minute, take a breather. There's so many other things that can contribute to it and, you know, and get out of this hustle culture. I got to do all the 20,000 things. And anyway, that's a whole nother conversation, but I think there's a connection there too with that. Mm-hmm. So one person asked about, and we just have a few more, um, your thoughts, do you have any thoughts on frontal fibrosing alopecia and is it possible to grow your hair back? Um, mm-hmm. So that's the scarring alopecia. Mm-hmm. And um, once again, sometimes the follicles that are scarred over are next to neighboring follicles that have not been scarred over. And so when you say reverse, I mean, if your follicle is no longer going to grow hair, then it's not going to grow hair anymore. Okay. Mm-hmm. But if you are one of the fortunate ones and you have those neighbors that are viable, those viable follicles, then you can camouflage and actually kind of offset the appearance of mm-hmm. that hair loss. So it depends. <laughs> it depends on the severity. Right, right. So, you know, if it's just starting and you're able to stop that inflammation and start to regrow the follicles that haven't scarred over then it may look like you know it's recovered Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but sometimes that's not possible possible and that that leads actually into the next question which is um it sounds like it's similar but with a different alopecia so the person suffered from a scarring alopecia actually this might be the same question she did some prp um but it just the treatment was four months um, and it didn't necessarily come back. And the question was, should she continue or is there another way to help, to help her? Knowing this, you cannot diagnose someone, you know, from a question. So I was just getting ready yes. to say, I am not qualified yeah. to answer yeah. that question. Yeah, I was like, it might just, they have, might have to find another dermatologist or trichologist, you know, partnership to- It's always good to have a, a second opinion. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And um, there, like I said, there are those who specialize in particular types of hair loss. Mm-hmm. So getting an opinion from someone who is an expert in that particular hair loss would would yeah. really be beneficial. So, yep. And this next one again that was actually these are all aligned with um, having hair grow back. And this person asked about having hair grow back from cca and they ask how but i feel like our, a common theme of our discussion is around it depends right <laughs> and and getting treatment from those areas because from my perspective some of yeah i it can grow back because i was diagnosed with early scarring you know it's all my this whole thing was gone mm. it wasn't completely bald like i had little but it was it was becoming 
it was it was on its way there. So as a as a patient, I can say that. So I think, but any anything you'd like to share from your perspective around um, growing back? Yeah, um, no, <laughs> because that caveat of it depends. Yeah, yeah. It really depends on the individual. I mean, I, I'm glad to hear that you have changed up your diet to incorporate turmeric, which is anti-inflammatory. Um, people don't realize just how lifestyle changings can work wonders. Mm -hmm. And people are always trying to put a topical on to solve the problem when in actuality, like I said, our bodies don't work as efficiently as they used to. Mm -hmm. And from all the different areas <laughs> of mm -hmm. biology that mm -hmm. you can help to support your, your mm -hmm. systems, biology, that is, mm -hmm. it, it's nothing wrong with uh, being holistic in, in your approach mm -hmm. and trying to solve the, the problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so, then how can you maintain a healthy scalp with CCC? And you've kind of talked about scalp health in general, but do you have any thoughts on the, on that one? Yeah, um, like you said, dietary changes. Um, but all, so we talk about anti-inflammatories a lot, but we don't talk about the inflammation. Um, <laughs> there are, I mean, the sad diet, the standard American diet that we incorporate into our lifestyle does not help us at all. <laughs> And so um, there are inflammatory foods that can probably, I mean, this hasn't been studied because our system's biology is so complicated and it's very difficult to study human beings. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times they use, you know, animal models to understand mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. if there are going to be um, changes based on regulating or having a controlled experiment. Um, but you cannot go wrong <laughs> with, um, eliminating some of those inflammatory foods, you know, and we know that sugar, yep, unhealthy fats. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. we already know this. Right. right. And I, I would have to say that if we had a healthier diet, that would help us a lot. It will give the opportunities of the treatments that are um, known to work, mm -hmm. it gives it a mm -hmm. better chance of working. And mm -hmm. so I think that that is extremely important. Yeah. Now, the other thing you asked about was? Um, maintaining a healthy scalp with CCCA. Oh, cleansing mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I, I would go so far to say that cleansing more frequently, even mm -hmm. so, if you wear your hair short and you cleanse like every three to four days, that would be great if you can do that. Mm -hmm. But um, cleansing is very important. And, and of course, consistency in following up and using the treatments right. that are given to you. I cannot tell you how many times I hear that people just aren't compliant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They just don't do what they should be doing. Mm -hmm. to do. It's extremely important. Yeah, I think the three to five, I also remember I went through a season when I was doing it, washing my hair like every three to four days or five days. And I, if I recall, I think it grew better even then. I went to seven. Anyway, you're making me think about <laughs> switching up my sort of process a little bit. And um, this is anecdotal. So I have um, heard and, well, so people who have, had clients to change where they've increased their cleansing frequency, they've mm -hmm. had better responses than those who don't. Yeah. So yeah. It's it's anecdotal, but I would be willing to bet that if there, but my hypothesis is right. that <laughs> right. if you increase your cleansing frequency, that you will also increase the rate of recovery. Okay. Got it. Okay. Three more and we're gonna be done. So the one is castor oil. So this person said, I've seen, um, I started to see more growth and thickening after using castor oil and some earlier creams, but still not able to really thicken the crown. 
um, do you have any suggestions? And as there's a, I know castor oil is like the big bad word in the community around. There's like the camp that is don't ever touch it. And then there's the camp it, that's it's everything that I need. So where do you fall in the castor oil um, and, and, the, and, and, and things that might be able to use, again, from a scientific perspective to help thicken hair? There is no data that shows that ca castor oil is effective. Mm -hmm. um, personally, I don't like castor oil because I don't like the aesthetics of it. It, okay. I, I mean, it's very viscous, meaning that it's what people would call thick. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I don't like the consistency of it. It holds on to, you know, dirt. And so it is like, mm, no. Um, so I don't like it. I would never tell people to use it for hair loss. But um, there are people, like you said, who swear by it. And I... I just say that I don't fix, I mean, I don't fix what's not broken. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so if you have found that that works for you um, and you are at a standstill, then I would seek the advice of a dermatologist for mm -hmm. other, other things that you can do <laughs> to, help Try to yeah, get to the areas that haven't filled in. But if it's scarred, um, then that may be problematic, but I believe that there is an opportunity for hair to grow if you get the right, right. the right treatment. Yeah. There was a um a dermatologist that I saw on TikTok, and she said, you know, similar like there's no scientific evidence. And the comment section from people was like they lit her up in terms of like it worked for me, it worked for me. So I one of my questions when I saw all that because I heard the science side of it, and then I saw all the comments. And I thought what we really need, quite frankly, is a study because we can say that there, the science doesn't say that, but has the science studied it? I agree 100%, you know? which is one of the reasons <laughs> why I collaborate with hair practitioners who want to be a part of scientific yeah. studies because not all practitioners have the same regimen mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. procedures. And if you are a practitioner who says, hey, my castor oil works because mm -hmm. a lot of practitioners sell their own products. Right, 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 right. I want to study that. Right. I get data behind the products or the methodologies that you use to help with hair loss. Right. That is one of the things that I am like all about because I have seen some trichologists work what I consider miracles. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. And some aren't. Right. So why is that? So that, that and exactly. That's yeah. my question. Cause I I I I I fall between I just like what I was saying. I feel like we're we have a lot of I've heard, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, but how do we know it doesn't? Let's take that back. It's hard to tell somebody what doesn't work when they're telling you that it does. It's also hard to work to say how it's working when it works for this person, but not for that person. Right. So how do we get <laughs> the answer. So. so that is why I partner with hair practitioners mm -hmm. because it's important to get the data right. and to know. And, and I try to advocate for that. Um, I'm right. like, we are in, in my opinion, we have a more sophisticated consumer base. Yes. We are reading, unfortunately, the wrong things a lot yeah. of the times, but we have people who desire to have the information, but mm -hmm. it's not out there. Mm -hmm. And personally, I like, especially as a scientist, I like to make informed decisions. Mm -hmm. So I'm all about the data. Like I, th mm -hmm. there are people always trying to say, oh, try this supplement. I'm like, mm, I'm mm -hmm. real mm -hmm. leery about the supplements mm -hmm. because they don't have to prove that their stuff works. They don't right. have to prove right. that their stuff is safe. They are supposedly, you know, the right. honor system, right. right? but they're not, it's not enforced. Right. And so I don't try, I mean, yeah, no, <laughs> can't handle that. So I say all that to say, same with, with supplements. Mm -hmm. I want to see the data before I start implementing anything be. And, and, the, and think the same should be true for products. Product. Exactly. And I, I agree with that in terms of even for supplements, when I chose to do them, 
from personally, I I went to the National Institute for Health. I went, I, I'm getting my doctorate in education. So I'm reading the studies. I'm learning about how to do the method, understand the methodology, the hypothesis. So personally, that was my ownership of, and I'm going to take it, you know, and I'm going to make sure they're third party tested, but not everybody can do that or does that. And that's, I'm not saying that people have to do that, but yes, they do. do. Own, they should. We have to own, like, we have to own, um, be advocates for ourselves and yes. and um, own some of that educational process. So, absolutely. But we're looking as consumers. Right. We're looking, exactly. and it's not there. Right. That's the issue, which is right. why I'm like, come on, let's get some data. <laughs> I mean, so as a trichologist, if you're putting trichologist after your name. And you really stand on science because right. that's what trichology is. So why wouldn't you get the data behind what you're doing? 100%. That 100%. just makes sense to me. And so I try to do it in a more economical way because it costs a lot of money to do clinical studies. Yeah, I and, can only imagine. <laughs> and there are things that you can do to get the data and not have to have that level of expense. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's what I do. Awesome. Okay. So the last question is around um, their red light laser therapy um, from your perspective, because there is um, people that are using it for CCCA. Um, so what are your thoughts around red light laser therapy? Yeah. So and if you have any recommendations, if you are a proponent of it, if you have any recommendations, if not, that's fine. So there are several brands that do have data to show mm -hmm. that using, I'm going to say low light laser therapy, mm -hmm. there is data to show that it works, mm -hmm. but not 100%. Okay. <laughs> like with anything. I mean, it with depends. Um, Minoxidil, that's not 100% either. Right, right. So right. there is evidence that it does work, um, but not all the time. And there aren't any brands that I advocate for. Okay. But um, yes, the what I would say is for anything, make sure you're making an informed decision. So make sure you ask for the data. So you were saying not everyone ha has to do that. And yes, I think everyone does have to do that. Um, and so yeah. look to make sure that they have the data mm -hmm. and that they're transparent. If okay. they don't have the data run, right. um, you want someone who is transparent about what it is and knowledgeable about what they're using and why. Mm -hmm. Always ask for the data. Mm -hmm. Always. <laughs> Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if they don't have it, because there are so many that are producing the data, those mm -hmm. are the ones that I would be more trusting of. Okay. And then you have to just kind of see for yourself. It really is at this point until we as scientists can understand how to personalize it a little bit more, when we have more of an understanding and can say, okay, people of who, who, have these particular characteristics that are going on with them, they are more responsive to this particular treatment. Right. So we get to that point. Right. And it is um, trial and error. Um, but I see that process changing, I'd say in the next 10 years, I think th there will be more research to help guide a little bit better. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It is exciting to hear and see that there are more conversations and that there are more, there's more research that, and I think with the work that you're doing with your partners and those of us who are dealing with it, just getting, getting out there, telling our stories, sharing our stories, the more we talk about it, I'm confident that the more we're going to get more results and more insight even, or just sometimes you just need a little bit of hope. And maybe it's not hope that you're going to get everything back, but hope as you're going through this scenario mm -hmm. that you're not alone. Um, so any closing words, any words of wisdom for those of us, um, the women on this channel, they're um, usually, we're sometimes in difficult places. And um, usually we ask for what are one or two things that, the, what's the next right thing from your perspective that we should be doing um, as we navigate this journey? Yes. Glad you asked that because... I am always on my soapbox about how we as consumers have the power. Mm -hmm. 
And if we don't demand that our products are not only made a particular way because everybody talks about, oh, I only want natural and that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> yeah. But the, the industry moved towards the demand. Mm -hmm. So if we demand to see the data, if we demand that as Black women in particular, especially those with the coilier hair types, mm -hmm. if we demand that, oh, I'm not going to buy a product that doesn't have data that shows that it works for my specific hair type, right. because for a long time, it's starting to change now, but I say starting to change. A lot of times they would make claims based on doing testing on hair that wasn't representative of us. Mm. And they weren't forced to either. Right. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we need to demand it and that will happen. And that right. leads to better products because they're actually testing on the substrate that's relevant to us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So first thing is we need to start um, demanding it mm -hmm. and demanding it with, you know, our dollars only support ask. those who do it. And not too many are, but it's starting. It's starting. Right. right. Um, now, until we can get that, um, actually on my, it's a link tree equivalent, um, but I do have a link that I would um, tell people to go to. And I have a template. If we can start writing letters for those companies who don't have data and we're like, okay, ask these very pointed mm, questions. Mm -hmm. If they start getting inundated with <laughs> that, they're going to be like, oh, crap. We need to do something and need to start changing. So I have a template so, that you can use to send <laughs> because we need to do something. We have the power. Look, that link, first of all, everybody, that link tree is going in the description box. Get to it. Number one, you can find Dr. Crystal and all these, but get to it because that's, this is how change happens. Oh, that's good. I didn't even know you were talking about that. That's good. We're, that's good. I yep. love this. I love, I love, I love, because we do a lot of talking a lot of times, but we also have to put action behind it. And you're giving us a mechanism to put action about how do we support this community? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. And the second thing I want to say is we have to start finding and it, it, it's, it's starting to grow. I, I'll say in another five to 10 years, we will have, I would say the critical mass of hair care scientists who look like us. Mm. And you have to find someone you trust. Yes. And you have to start participating in studies. Yes. I know that that is not popular, yeah. but that is truly the only way that we will be able to understand the personalization that is necessary mm -hmm. for us. I mean, in order to personalize, we need to know some things. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm saying we as scientists, and if you only trust Black scientists, then I'm here. Right. <laughs> and there are others right. who right. won't be tied to corporate confines because to be honest, most of the Black hair care scientists are with corporations. Mm -hmm. which they are brilliant. I have worked, well, a lot of the um, hair care scientists are brilliant. So I don't want to say that, mm -hmm. you know, right. um, one demographic is and the other one isn't. But there is this new program at Spelman and they're going to start educating scientists, you know, and so mm -hmm. with it being uh, HBCU, that wow. means, you know, the barrier of entry is lowered because if you want to support, you know, Mm -hmm. HBCUs and you want to get into this field, then you mm -hmm. have an option that way. But I mentioned earlier, I had no idea that this world even existed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if I wasn't chosen to have that interview, I, I, I would not, I already know, I would not even be in this area. So right, right. Um, we need to participate in studies that is what we need to do. And we are growing in number. And so if the issue is you don't trust people, then there are people that you can trust. And um, it, it's more than just myself mm -hmm. um, right now. Like there are dermatologists who also conduct studies. Mm -hmm. And 
it's just extremely important that we we are considered because there are unique needs right and we have right. unique lifestyles and environments that right. need to be considered and in order for us to optimize the information that we can provide to you as consumers, that is necessary. So absolutely write letters, demand it and participate in the studies. Those are my two takeaways. I love it. <laughs> and we're going to have a mechanism again, a tool in her link tree that go, it's going to show us exactly where we need to go to do it. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And I have a video. I don't remember. Well, because someone asked a question and I was like, you know what? I'm going to make a template. I'm going to make this available. Okay. So I talked about this on one of my lunchtime chats, the Our Black Hair Matters. If you want to shoot me the link to that, or I can go in there. I, I'll, I'll link it in the description box too. So people can, if they want to, you know, go into that and do that. To, to yeah, take a look absolutely. At but go into that link tree and, and get yeah, that information tree. and send, yes, send letters, demand. We have the power. Yes. Yeah. You, you got it. You got it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This was so good. And you gave and me- And it was long. I feel really, you were I feel No, no, no. Bad. You were very generous with your time. So I have nothing but thanks to you, um, Dr. Crystal. And so uh, you are always welcome back here. If you, if there's anything you need from this, from us, from this channel, I'm here for you. We're here for you. So- Well, I think with an initiative that you already know of, I know I'm being a little secretive, but- <laughs> I will be back because we got to talk about that's right next steps. I was going to stay tuned. <laughs> stay tuned. All right. Thank you, Dr. Crystal. No problem.